President DeJoya, Mr. Bunch, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Georgetown University. We have assembled today to confer upon Mr. Lonnie G. Bunch III our highest honor, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa Georgetown University is in turn honored by his presence here today. Please remain standing if you could for a few moments for the singing of the Vene Creator Spiritus performed by the Georgetown University Concert Choir under the direction of Frederick Binkholder, Associate Professor of the Practice in the Department of Performing Arts and for the opening prayer, which will be offered by Dr. Marsha Shatlin, Associate Professor in the Department of History.
Creator, we gather today to celebrate the gift of memory. You have endowed us with the ability to recall the past, to savor times gone by, and to commemorate the struggles of our ancestors, the creation of our nations, and absorb the wind wisdom of the generations. We pray. The Lord responds. <laughs> we pray that we continue to honor the legacy of the slave, the sharecropper, the marcher, the marginalized, the incarcerated, and the ignored. Let us never forget your daughters who guided us toward freedom. May we remember Ida, the writer, Septima, the educator, Rosa, the resistor, Ella, the organizer, Fanny Lou, the leader, and Shirley, the public servant. Let us learn from your sons whose sacrifice for liberation stirs us to action today. Martin, the dreamer, Malcolm, the believer, Emmett, the sacrificial lamb, Medgar, the voice of the voiceless, and Andrew, James, and Michael, the brothers bound together in movement and in death. Let us pray for the peaceful rest for those we lost to violence and comfort the families who weep. We pray for the souls of Tanisha, of Sandra, of Freddie, of Trayvon, of Michael, of Renisha, of Laquan, and of Natasha. Bless the hallowed grounds of your people's greatest fights for freedom. Bless the plantations of Southern Maryland. Bless the bridges of Selma. Bless the streets of Baltimore. Bless the walls of our great museum. Bless the tribal lands of our nation. Bless the borders of our world. We ask you to strengthen our resolve to seek and do justice. Order our steps and our spirits to stand up against the rise of extremism in our times. Sharpen our vision to see and care for those rendered invisible and transform our hearts to hear and sing the music that flows from our tears. We ask all of this in the name of your son, whose life provides the blueprint for our struggle, whose words sustain us during our journeys, and whose sacrifice reminds us of the love you have for all your people. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our founder, Most Reverend John Carroll, the first Archbishop of Baltimore, and the first Catholic Bishop in the United States took legal possession of this land on this hilltop in 1789 and we mark that as our founding date. Our first student, the future North Carolina Congressman William Gaston, arrived in 1791, and our first bachelor's degrees were not awarded until 1817. 1814 saw the British attack on the city of Baltimore and their invasion of Washington as part of the so-called War of 1812. And for a time, we know the college lived in great fear that it would be overrun. But we escaped and we thrived. Hence, in 1815, over 200 years ago, with enrollments passing the 100 mark, the college president, Father John Grassi of the Society of Jesus asked then Congressman William Gaston to present a petition for a federal charter, a document that still today sanctions the academic business that we do here. It is our custom to initiate academic ceremonies such as this one with a reading of this charter and to discharge that office, I have the honor to introduce Mr. Edward M. Quinn, Secretary of the University. An act concerning the College of Georgetown in the District of Columbia. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that it shall and may be lawful for such persons as now are, or from time to time may be, 
the president and directors of the College of Georgetown within the District of Columbia, to admit any of the students belonging to said college or other persons meriting academical honors to any degree in the faculties, arts, sciences, and liberal professions to which persons are usually admitted in other colleges and universities of the United States, and to issue in an appropriate form the diplomas or certificates which may be requisite to testify to the admission of such degree. Signed, Langdon Chivas, Speaker of the House of Representatives, John Guyard, President Pro Tempore of the Senate, approved March 1st, 1815, James Madison. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. The honorary degree citation will be read by Dr. Maurice Jackson, Associate Professor in the Department of History. Professor Jackson. Lenny Bunch. <laughs> Georgetown University is honored to recognize an extraordinary historian and human being who shares with us a more complete understanding of our nation's history and who today serves as the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, Lonnie G. Bunch III. As a young man in Belleville, New Jersey, Mr. Bunch developed a passion for history inspired by his family, his grandfather Lonnie Sr. showing him a book of old black and white photographs his father, Lonnie Jr., a World War II veteran, sharing with him John Hope Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom, A History of Negro Americans, and the stories of past generations that were told and retold at family gatherings. His father and his mother, Montrose, were both public school teachers. As such, Lonnie took his, this interest in history to college, studying first at Howard University, ultimately receiving both his undergraduate and graduate degrees from American University. Following his studies, Mr. Bunch served in leadership roles at museums across the country, at the California African American Museum, at the Smithsonian Institution, and at the Chicago Historical Society, where he led a successful capital campaign and institutional reorganization, helping to lay the foundation for the transformation into the Chicago History Museum. At each of these organizations, he curated groundbreaking exhibitions. At the California African American Museum, he created the Black Olympians, 1904 to 1984, and Black Angelinos, the African American in Los Angeles, 1850 to 1950. At the, Carnegie, at the Chicago Historical Society, he organized the exhibition Teen Chicago, and at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, he curated the permanent exhibition, The American Presidency, A Glorious Burden. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I didn't mean that. <laughs> In these roles, he demonstrated his exceptional ability to propel institutions forward, deepening and strengthening their respective missions. A prolific author, Mr. Bunch is taught at the American University, at George Washington University, and at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. In his scholarship, as with his seminal essay, Flies in the Buttermilk, Museums, Diversity, and the Will to Change. He is engaged with topics ranging from the significance of the first transcontinental flight by African-American aviators to the lack of diversity in the workforce of our nation's cultural institutions. He was appointed to the Committee for the Preservation of the White House, first by President George W. Bush in 2002, and subsequently reappointed by President Barack Hussein Obama in 2010. In 2005, Mr. Bunch was given the mandate of conceptualizing, building, and leading the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. For more than a decade, he worked tirelessly to transform this museum from a long-held aspiration into a powerful space for remembrance and engagement in the heart of the National Mall. In, his opening land, in, in opening this landmark museum, Mr. Bunch has forged a new opportunity for all of us to honor and celebrate the many dimensions of the African-American story, creating a place that encourages reflection, dialogue, and understanding. 
In his own words, Mr. Bunch has described his vision for the museum. Quote, I want people who come through the museum to be changed, to realize that the African-American experience is the quintessential American experience. I want people to realize that this is their story as well. In recognition of Mr. Bunch's singular commitment to advancing and illuminating the full range, depth, and complexity of our shared American history, Georgetown University is proud to confer upon Lonnie G. Bunch III the, de the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Congress of the United States and by the Board of Directors of Georgetown University, I officially confer upon Lonnie G. Bunch III the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. The Georgetown University Concert Choir will now perform an arrangement of the well-known spiritual Steal Away, which was composed by Wallace Willis in 1862. This song, along with expressing a deep religious faith, also contains the hidden message of escaping to freedom through its use of the relentless refrain, Steal Away. It is an exemplar of this musical form. This setting was created by Gwyneth Walker.
Thank you very much for that beautiful musical interlude. <clears throat> I now have the privilege to present the 48th president of Georgetown University, John J. DeGioia. Well, thank you very much, Provost Groves. Mr. Bunch, honored guests, members of our Georgetown community, welcome. I want to thank you for your presence today as we honor the career and contributions of Lonnie Bunch and recognize him with this honorary degree. I wish to offer a very special welcome to Mr. Bunch's wife, Maria Maribel Bunch. It's wonderful to have you with us here this evening. I also like to express our appreciation to the Georgetown University Concert Choir, led, led by Frederick Binkholder, and the Voices of Inspiration Choir, led by Reverend Nolan Williams, Jr. Your performances this afternoon make this already very special gathering that much more special by your presence, so thank you. Well, today we've come to gather to celebrate Lonnie Bunch, the history and culture of African Americans that he has brought to life on our national mall, and the transformative power of his work to deepen our understanding of our shared American story. Just moments ago, we heard about Mr. Bunch's innovative leadership at cultural institutions across our country, about his distinguished scholarship, about his creative and compelling curatorial work. His extraordinary efforts, whether collecting the Greensboro Woolworths lunch counter for the Smithsonian's American History Museum, installing the actual track that gold medalist Carl Lewis ran on in an exhibition on black Olympians at the California African American Museum, or preserving the oral histories of young women and men as part of his Teen Chicago project, reflect his belief that history is in his own words much more than a collective series of names and dates of events long forgotten. He brought this vision of history, of remembrance, to life in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, where he first collected and then transformed an extraordinary group of artifacts into an urgent, powerful, and profound illumination of the American story. Already, the museum's impact has been extraordinary. In the four months since it opened, tens of thousands have packed the iconic structure on the National Mall, between six and 8,000 visitors a day, exploring its 400,000 square feet of exhibits, almost 37,000 artifacts, Harriet Tubman's hymnal and Chuck Berry's red Cadillac, Nat Turner's Bible and the dress Marian Anderson wore when she sang from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Young Emmett Till's glass coffin, Muhammad Ali's boxing gloves, and even a Georgetown starter jacket. <laughs> These objects, as Mr. Bunch sh shared the day the museum opened, are a clarion call to remember. To remember, he said, not just the well-known, but also those famous only to their families, whose lives and quiet ways shaped this nation. We remember so we can ponder the pain of slavery, segregation, and second-class citizenry. But we also find the resiliency, the faith, the hope, the joy that is so much a part of the African-American community. Close quote. Guided by his belief in the power of history, of remembrance, he's enabled us to honor, explore, celebrate, and recognize who we are as a nation and the promise we continue to seek to fulfill. We have a responsibility to seek this promise, the American promise, the American dream, the American ideal, 
here in our nation's capital, in the city of Duke Ellington and Langston Hughes, the city of John R. Thompson, Jr., and the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton. We have an obligation to seek this promise across our nation, from Ferguson to Baltimore, from Charleston to Chicago, from Minneapolis to New Orleans. And we have a responsibility to seek this promise here, within this university community of which we are all a part, the oldest Catholic and Jesuit institution in the United States, a place that grew side by side with our nation. Last week in our Let Freedom Ring celebration at the Kennedy Center, the Voices of Inspiration Choir, led by the Reverend Nolan Williams, Jr., shared a deeply moving piece inspired by our community's efforts to engage in the work of remembrance and reconciliation regarding our own institutions past with slavery and dedicated to the descendants of the 272 enslaved children, women, and men of the Maryland plantations. We will hear this work entitled, We Choose to Remember in just a few moments. All of us share in the responsibility, the choice articulated by John Hope Franklin 60 years ago when he provided a new framing of the history of our nation. Professor Franklin said, what we need to do as a nation and as individual members of society is to confront our past and see it for what it is. And having done that, we should then make a good faith effort to turn our history around. These words have an ever greater meaning today with Professor Franklin, with his service as the founding chair of the National Museum of African American History and Culture's scholarly, Scholar Advisory Committee, which he served in the years before his passing. There have been moments in history when creative individuals, creative communities have responded to the demands of their times and found new ways to engage the world. John Hope Franklin, shaping a new history. Martin Luther King Jr., fusing a philosophy of nonviolence to the unfinished American project. Rosa Parks, deciding to take a different seat. In each case, they understood the demands of their particular moment. This is another such moment for all of us to understand our history and to envision a new future. Lonnie Bunch has helped to make this history, these individuals and their contributions present for us by creating in his words, a place for all Americans to ponder, reflect, learn, rejoice, collaborate, and ultimately draw sustenance and inspiration from the lessons of history to make America better." Close quote. It is a privilege to have this opportunity to celebrate this extraordinary individual and his lifelong commitment to helping us more fully understand that basic truth that in the words of James Baldwin, history does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and that history is literally present in all we do. It's my pleasure to present to you Georgetown's most recent alumnus, Lonnie G. Bunch, the third. Okay, I'm about as humble as I've ever been in my life. I, um, I almost can't speak, almost. <laughs> I can't thank you all for this amazingly wonderful honor, an honor that I'm not sure I'm worthy of. But I must admit, I owe you a great debt of gratitude because I can't wait to call my mom and say, I finally got into Georgetown. <laughs> 
This honor means so much to me because it's an affirmation of the efforts of so many. And while you hear stories about me, it's really because so many people who were members of the board of trustees or so many of my colleagues who are here today, both from the museum and from the Smithsonian, and the fact that thousands of people supported this museum, gave money, gave collections, gave their stories, gave their trust. Because of that, we were able to birth this museum. And it's important to realize just how long an 11 year gestation period of gestation is. <laughs> because when we began, we began with a staff of two. We had no idea where the museum would be. We had no collections, no money raised. But what we had was a belief that emanated from the African American community, a belief that you could make a way out of no way, a belief that said, we will fulfill the dreams, the hopes of so many generations who fought for, who campaigned, who believed that there needed to be a museum that would help us all to remember. That notion of remembering is so powerful. And for me, it was reinforced by getting to know somebody in Chicago named Mamie Till Mobley, the mother of Emmett Till. She came to my office and talked for seven hours about what happened to her son. And then she said to me, for 50 years, she carried the burden of remembering, of remembering Emmett Till. She said, it's now the turn for you and museums to help us remember. So in some ways, the most important thing this museum does is recenter the African-American experience, to help you remember maybe in new ways the people you know, the stories you've told, but also to be introduced to people whose lives have shaped this country, but we don't know anything about them. For us, the goal is simple. It's to let people remember so that they can confront America's tortured racial past, so that we can illuminate all the dark corners of this nation's history. Because if we don't, there is nothing as awful as a people who are forgotten, as a history that is neglected. For us, we think it's crucially important that this museum, as John Hope Franklin told me time and time again, must tell the unvarnished truth. It must be a place where you are going to cry when you ponder the pain of slavery and segregation. It has to be a place that says America must confront itself, must realize who it once was so that it can become the nation it says it is in its stated ideals. For us, this museum had to be a place where people actually found the truth. But equally important, we had to help people understand that this museum was not a museum by black people for black people. That in essence, this is a museum that said, if you care about America, if you care about our ideals, if you care about our notions of spirituality, optimism, resiliency, this is the place for you. This story is a story of us all. And in many ways, the goal is to help people understand that by wrestling with the African-American experience, by understanding America through the lens of the African-American experience, it means that we will finally find an opportunity to realize that we are more alike than we are different. We will find an opportunity to realize that there is nothing that we can't do when we dip into the reservoir of the past and believe what is possible. I have, to be, I have to be honest, for us who have built this museum, it is crucially important to help all of us realize how much we have been shaped by the African American experience. And I have to be honest, when we built this museum, we knew that creating a national museum was important. But no one could imagine the impact of opening the museum at the end of the term of President Obama. 
Think about it. When we began 11 years ago, there was no Obama. He was a state senator I knew in Chicago and thought he'll be a good state senator. <laughs> but sitting on that stage when we opened, sitting on that stage with President and Mrs. Obama, President and, George, and Mrs. Bush, the Chief Justice of the United States and my personal hero, John Lewis, I was struck, not by the speeches, not even by the crowd. I was struck by the fact that how wonderful it is when Americans of diverse cultures and political viewpoints come together to accomplish the difficult. That day was America at its best. And as we wrestle with the future, I'll never forget that America at its best can do amazing things. I have been moved by the mil nearly one million people who have visited the museum since the opening. I've been overwhelmed hearing stories, watching grandparents share stories, share their memories with their grandchildren to make sure the past is not forgotten, to help grandchildren understand where they fit within this long arc of history. I was struck and amazed as I see strangers come together, sharing their thoughts about the civil rights movement, about Frederick Douglass. It moved me so to realize that the museum is helping people, helping strangers find common ground. It made me realize that ultimately the goal of the museum was not to be a green museum, although it is the first green museum on the mall. The goal was not to just have good exhibitions and collections that engage and educate, but the goal was to be a place that makes America better by illuminating all the dark corners of the American past and by providing a safe and trusted space that bring people together. So tonight, I accept this honor very humbly on behalf of all the people who sacrifice so much to make this dream a reality. I accept this recognition on behalf of the enslaved women who got up every morning and fed their kids before they went into the fields and refused to let the fields strip them of their humanity, of their hope. I accept this on behalf of the families that left Mississippi in 1913 for the south side of Chicago in hope of a better day. And I accept this on behalf of women like my own grandmother who took in other people's laundry and scrubbed other people's floors so that her children and grandchildren would not have to do this. Ultimately, by bestowing this honor on me, what you are really saying what you are really embracing is that there is nothing more powerful than a people, than a nation steeped in its history. And there's nothing more noble than honoring all of our ancestors by remembering. Thank you all so much for this honor. Particularly honored this evening to be able to present Nolan Williams Jr. and the Voices of Inspiration with tenor Michael White. They will perform the composition commissioned by Georgetown University and composed by Nolan Williams Jr. for Georgetown's 
2017 Let Freedom Ring celebration at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in observance of Martin Luther King Day. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Provost Groves, and thank you, uh, President DeJoya, and congratulations, Dr. Bunch. Um, there is a moment in this piece where we want all of you to be involved. How many of you were at the Kennedy Center just a few days ago? So, oh, wow, great. We have section leaders all throughout the, <laughs> the auditorium. Um, there's a point where we remember, um, and uh, while I am so moved by the themes that are, are reflected in this program, the power of a community coming together and deciding, yes, we will remember, we choose to remember. And um, even as this campus has, has uh, wrestled with this history, this um, uh, unearthed history, um, there was a renaming of buildings temporarily, and those names were Freedom and Remembrance. And there's a point in this song where we would like for you to join in that chant. And so I'm wondering if this side of the room can be the freedom side, and this side of the room can be the remembrance side. Can we practice this? So just say, freedom, go. Freedom. Oh, you got to say it with a bit of enthusiasm. <laughs> Here we go, and. Freedom. And. One more. Oh, wow, they've got you beat. <laughs> You've got to match that enthusiasm. Here we go, and. Freedom. And. Freedom. We're going to do that seven times. I'm going to turn around and I'll point at you and you all. Up here, pick one and join <laughs> in. <laughs> we choose to remember.
Yes, we will remember. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Punch. If you could please stand and join in the singing of the alma mater and remain standing for the benediction which will be offered by Reverend Matthew Carnes of the Society of Jesus and Associate Professor in the Department of Government. For those of you who are new to Georgetown, the words and the music of the alma mater are printed on the back of your program. pray. Gracious God, we turn to you in thanks as we bring to a close this celebration in honor of Dr. Lonnie Bunch and his monumental contribution to our nation's remembering and reclaiming and learning from our African American history and culture. Remembering as he, as he has and as he has invited us to do with a steady, unflinching, yet compassionate gaze matters. It matters perhaps more than ever today. 
St. Ignatius Loyola, from whom our university takes its inspiration, taught that memory is a sacred gift from you, grounding us in our experience of lives and history that are charged with both beauty and brokenness. Our memory humbles us. It lays bare all our faults. It inspires us because it proclaims a resilience and a dignity that could not and cannot be ultimately diminished or destroyed. On this campus in the last year, our experience has shown us that it is an honest remembrance that a meaningful reckoning can begin and that the seeds of reconciliation can be sown. This evening, we've heard moving words about the challenges and opportunities that lie before us as a community and as a nation. And we've been inspired by the way that spectacular now inverted pyramid that has arisen there on the National Mall helps focus our understanding inspires us to think anew about the history that we live and create today. Lord God, we ask you to expand our hearts and minds even further as we go forth this night. Help us to be unafraid to be confronted by our present moment, which bears the heavy legacy and promise of the past. Make us courageous listeners, learners, reconcilers, and healers as we face the divisions of our day as we seek to make sure that every American and every person who shares in any way on the life of these shores is recognized and celebrated for their unique, precious life and dignity. Tonight, O oh God, we beg your blessing upon us that we may be people of both memory and action, of unwavering justice and unquenchable compassion, living ever more fully the promise of unity amidst diversity, that you loved into us in creating us. So we call upon you, long-suffering God of history, patient God of the present, and reconciling generous God of the future to bless and inspire us this day and always. And we pray in your most holy name, amen. Kindly remain standing, if you will, at your places until the academic procession has left Gaston Hall. On behalf of President DeJoya and Dr. Bunch, I thank you for coming today. In particular, I thank the members of the Georgetown University Concert Choir and their director, Frederick Binkholder, and the voices of inspiration and their director, Nolan Williams, who have undoubtedly enhanced our ceremony this evening with their beautiful music. Please join me in thanking them. You are all invited on behalf of President DeJoy and our esteemed honoree, I extend this invitation at the reception that will follow immediately on the second floor of this building and I am happy to announce that the honorary degree exercises for Dr. Lonnie G. Bunch III are now officially closed. Thank you.